I just want to thank you for being faithful to the house of the Lord. It's a nasty day out there. And um, I remember I was lying in bed probably about 11 o'clock, and I noticed for the first time, I think it started about 10, but <clears throat> then checked the weather, and it's raining all night last night and all day today. And, you know, it has a tendency to kind of affect the crowd and affect the mood and all those things. And how many of you know that we're not to be a bunch of, of, of thermometer Christians? Are, are, are you hearing me this morning? I, I really believe that from a spirit of servanthood, that is literally from the bottom up, we're to be a thermostat people. We're to set the temperature in the room. We're to, we're to set the mood. And there is nothing worse than claiming the joy of the Lord and having a face that doesn't show it. You know who I'm talking to this morning. Some of you need to notify your face. Let it know. I have the joy of the Lord. As the old preacher said, you look like you've been sucking on a persimmon baptized in, in lemon juice. And Anyway, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you are here. We've been, we've been training our core. We've been doing these crunches. You know what core training is? You get in the gym and it's all about everything that is the trunk, you know, the everything in here because all of your strength, all of your functionality, all of your mobility flows out of your core strength. And so it's important that you don't just do all of these little isolation exercises and, you know, do the, the, the bicep curls, you know, buys for the girls and tries for the guys, I think is how they say it, you know, in terms of making your arms bigger and all these different kinds of things. But we pay attention to um, our core and our core values here at Victory, we've been going over here at the beginning of the year. And as we um, as we look at this, we're concluding this morning. We're going to have a special extended time of communion today. We're not going to be taking it on mass with with the little cups, but we have five stations around the room. We'll be offering prayer and ministry. And so the end of the service will be a little bit different than it normally is. And I think that's a good thing. I don't think that we should always just come in and everything be completely predictable. Uh, and, and if you like that and you're a guest this morning, if you like predictability, then just, you know, go ahead and there's a seat belt under your seat there. Go ahead and strap it. Uh, anyway, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> but uh, I want to thank our lead team, Pastor Jeremy, Pastor Haley, for doing a wonderful job in helping me to present these five core values. This morning, we conclude with the idea of excelling by maximizing our resources for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And we're not just talking about how we steward the money at victory, but we're talking about the composite of the resources that are in this room. And I'm going to break that down this morning. I don't want to get ahead of myself and jump in and unpack that yet. But I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And I'm reading from the message. Eugene Peterson has been a hero of mine literally for decades. Presbyterian pastor, scholar, um, seminary professor, theologian, great writer, um, and he gave us the message paraphrase, which makes an attempt to put the scripture into street language. Um, I think that it probably was that maybe 20 years ago. I still love the message. It's been around for about 30 years. And so this morning I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 through 9. I, Paul, have been called and sent. Everybody say called and sent. Now there's a whole lot happening between the calling and the sending. That and right there is packed. I, Paul, have been called and sent by Jesus, the Messiah, according to God's plan. Everybody say God's plan. Along with my friend Sosthenes, I send this letter to you in God's church at Corinth. 
believers cleaned up by Jesus and set apart for a God-filled life. Most of American Christianity is reductionist thinking. It's about all about getting a ticket to heaven, buying some fire insurance, um, possessing a, a home on Glory Land Boulevard, the corner of Hallelujah Lane, and um, not doing away. I believe heaven is real, but I believe that there is so much more to the fact that God made you for a purpose. He made you with purpose for a purpose. Somebody say amen. amen. And so he's cleaned, he's cleaned us up by Jesus and set apart for a God-filled life. I include in my greeting all who call out to Jesus wherever they live. So this is not just geographically limited, it's not time limited, but it uh, goes out to generations in which we live today. Wherever they live, he is their master as well as ours. Somebody say amen. amen. Verse 3, may all the gifts and benefits that come from God our Father and the master Christ, Jesus Christ, be yours. Verse 4, every time I think of you, and I think of you often, I thank God for your lives of free and open access to God given by Jesus. Somebody say thank you. There's no end to what has happened in you. It's beyond speech, beyond knowledge. The evidence of Christ has been clearly verified in your lives. If you've encountered Jesus, there should be some evidence. There should be a difference. We don't just keep on looking identical to the world and acting like the world and having the same bad attitudes as the world. Just think, you don't need a thing. You've got it all. All God's gifts are right in front of you as you wait expectantly for our Master Jesus to arrive on the scene for the finale. And not only that, but God Himself is right alongside to keep you steady. Everybody say steady. Keep you steady and go and, and on track until things are all wrapped up by Jesus. God who got you started in this spiritual adventure, I love that, shares with us the life of his son and our master Jesus. Everybody read the last two lines with me. Here we go. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. Say it again. He will never give up on you. Never forget forget that. Our one thing this morning is five statements wrapped in one. So I'm, we're not going to do this three or four times. Just want to make sure, give it to me 150% the very first time we say it because I want to be mindful of our time because we want to have ample time for ministry and communion this morning. Here we go. Come on. We are purposed by God, each with a unique mix of characteristics Suited for a life of excellence that comes when we faithfully manage what we've been given all to the glory of God. That's a mouthful right there. Whole lot said in those five components of this one complex statement. We are purposed by God, each with a unique mix of characteristics, suited means God has equipped you. He's put on the clothes you need appropriate for the occasion. Suited for a life of excellence that comes when we faithfully manage what we've been given and all to the glory of God. A quick review of our core values. We intentionally create an environment. There is something in the room that didn't just happen by accident. We are intentionally involved in propagating the grace that is in the room. Victory Church is presence-centered. We want the presence of God here every time we gather. If He is not here, then why even fool with going through the motions? He has to be here. It is His presence. Like Moses said, okay, we'll, we'll go up and we'll, we'll cross over the, over the Red Sea and into the wilderness and we'll lead the people toward the promised land. But he said, if you're not going, I ain't going. If you're not going with us, I'm not going. And so we have to have, everybody say, his presence. Victory is presence-centered. It is gospel-driven. It is the message of the life-giving, transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that drives everything we do. But then we are kingdom-focused. We are focused on advancing the lordship of Jesus Christ in our individual lives, our homes, our families, our health, our finances our spiritual walk with God, our community in the Delta. 
in every sphere of influence, in our neighborhoods, in our industry, in our commerce, in our businesses, in our education, we have to let our light shine. Look at your neighbor and say, let your light shine. We intentionally create an environment where we embrace diversity in our community. We are not just haphazardly here hoping that we can get a few folk to join the club. We are intentional and on a mission sent by God. Victory is a missionary church sent by God to the Delta, to the Mid-South. That means that we don't leave any group of people unexposed to the life-giving message of the gospel. If there's a group that is outcast, if there is a group that is looked down upon, then we rise up in the love of God and in compassion, not compromise. Com- compromise and compassion are two different things. If it meant having compassion means that we compromise our values, then God could have never had compassion on us. Yeah. Say it with me. Compassion is not compromise. So that means that we need to have a church that reflects the demographic, the the, the demographic view of what Crittenden County looks like. And I'm thankful to see that that's growing in this room. Somebody put your hands together and give the Lord praise. We engage people with the life giving message of Jesus Christ. We equip Christ followers to lead in every area of life. And then finally this morning, we excel in maximizing our resources for the advancement of the kingdom of God. I want to give you five steps very quickly. I'm going to move through this just lickety split. Number one, understand your purpose. Our first statement in our one thing, remember, we are purposed by God. Everybody say, understand your purpose. When you read the New Testament, there are mission statements that Jesus gives in every gospel. In John 10.10, he said, the thief comes but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But he said, I have come. How many of you know what he said? I have come that what? That you might have life and have it what? More abundantly, to the fullest, the NIV says. 1 John 3.8 says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest. To destroy the works of the evil one. Now the translation says the devil. The literal meaning of the word destroy means to annihilate. There ain't nothing left. He drops a heavenly nuclear bomb on the works of the devil. How many of you know, he didn't say that a weapon won't form, but he said no weapon formed against you will prosper. Come on, somebody. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, the Gospel of Mark says. Understanding your purpose means you recognize that God has had a direct hand in creating your unique life. Ephesians 2.10 says, I'm going to quote it first from the King James. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. Another translation says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. He made us with purpose for a purpose. Do you understand your purpose? The Greek word here for masterpiece, for workmanship, literally is the Greek word for poem. How many of you know sometimes everything in your life doesn't quite rhyme, but God's still writing a story? And the masterpiece is that he is writing the life of his words in your actions and your deeds, your thoughts and your words and your deeds. Somebody say amen. So your life is to be a living demonstration of the message that we proclaim, the gospel. We are purposed by God with a unique mix of characteristics. Point number two, know your shape. This is how you can understand your purpose. Know your shape. God is not redundant. God is not stuttering when it comes to the production of these containers that carry the glory of God. 
in the very same way that every snowflake is unique. I've seen documentaries and slides under microscopes where they would take a snowflake and then put it beside another one and you would see the the incredible intricacies of the the four and six and eight and 16-sided, just all of these amazing, what look like cut diamonds. And every, end, it just blows your mind to think. We, when we got that this middle of the month in January, and normally in February, I'm always saying I'd really like to have one more snow. But after we got that, I got all I want this winter. I'm hoping that Groundhog did his thing on Friday. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that spring comes early because I'm ready for some warm weather. I, I got out yesterday and the sunshine just blessed me down to my toes. Mm. Know your shape because there's a new uniqueness to you. And there's, there, there, there are a hundred different ways I could approach this. I, I could remind you that God asked Moses, what's in your hand? And God used the staff in Moses' hand to make him a shepherd to lead the people of God. Joshua didn't have a staff in his hand. He had a sword in his hand. So it shifted from the move of a shepherd to the leadership of a soldier. And it was timely because it was time for them to go in and possess the land. What's in Moses' hand? And God would also ask you, what is in your heart? We're going to get to that this morning. And I want you to see this with me. What is... Do you know your shape? There are five letters in the acronym, and this makes it easy to understand and easy to remember. S-H-A-P-E. The first one are your spiritual gifts. There are numerous spiritual gifts. There There are three knowing where we are given a piece of the omniscience of God. He knows all things. We know in part. We see in part. But with the spiritual gifts listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, sometimes God gives us just a glimpse and we see a piece of some information or knowledge and three knowing gifts, three speaking gifts, three doing gifts. And isn't that interesting because where you're attacked are in your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. But with the spiritual gifts, those of the Holy Spirit, we can know the thoughts after God speaks them to us. We can speak the words after God infuses them into our hearts, and then we can do the deeds of God. Now, there are also motivational gifts. Some folk have an organizational gift. Some folk have a teaching gift, a leadership gift on your life. Some folk have the gift of generosity. You, you can take 10 you can take $10 and turn it into 1000 You can take 100 and turn it into 10000 And God blesses the fruit of your labors and the work of your hands. And there are people that are actually called with a spiritual gift to give over and above the tithe and the offering. And they're called to carry the financial responsibility of a vision for the kingdom of God. And there are all kinds of motivational gifts that are unique to who you are that God has made you. And so you want to ask the question, what are the spiritual gifts that God has given to me since I have come to Christ? The second one is your shape, S-H. What is in your heart? I was asking the question just a moment ago. What's in your heart? The Bible says in Psalm 37, 4, Delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean that if I'll just read a chapter a day that God will give me a new Tesla or a Bentley or, God forbid, whatever it is that the prosperity teachers teach. And I believe in biblical prosperity. I just don't believe in a lot of the nonsense that's going on out there, and I'll leave that alone. But I believe that when you give your heart to God, He will cause the desires you're supposed to have to be in your heart. I will give you the desires of your heart is what it's saying. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says, For it is God which works in you the want to, the will, and the desire to do His good pleasure. He will give you the desires of your heart. So what are those desires? What breaks your heart? When you look in the community, when you look in our culture, what do you see that breaks your heart? That You, you, you can back up and you can gauge the, the, 
the, the, I believe the heart of God inside your heart by saying what makes you sad, what makes you mad, and what makes you glad. Don't discount your emotions. They're there for a reason. They're things that stir up Glenda that don't stir up Jordan. And, 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 and there are things that stir up Jeremy that don't stir up Randy. And things that stir up Randy, we could go around the room. And there are things that make us uniquely mad and sad and glad. And, and I believe that's the makeup. That's the shape. That's what's coming out of your heart. Because, because God has given you a set of desires that are tied to your Purpose. Everybody say purpose. SP or SH, I'm sorry. Spiritual gifts, heart desires. A, abilities, natural abilities. Some of you in this room have all kinds of skill sets and talents. Some of you are mathematical. And you actually do a job that uses that Pythagorean theorem that the other 99% of us don't figure out yet what even say it's about. No poo-pooing on the math teachers. We love you. And even if we never use it for a moment, it I was going to say it taught us to think logically. Really, it probably made us mad if we tell the truth. <laughs> For those of you who think you don't speak in tongues, just go back to algebra class. You know what I'm talking about. You have some natural abilities. You have gifts. Some of you can sing. Some of you have the ability to just see a set of circumstances, and you can, you can discern the big picture, and you can arrive at a solution. There's leadership on some of your lives. There's a motivational gift that comes out when you get in a crowd. Some of you walk in the room and everybody gets quiet and they just turn to look because you've got something on you that is a leadership gift. Some of us have the gift of serving. We all ought to be servants of Christ, but some of us can go exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Some of you are just servants galore, servants extraordinaire. Gift of serving. And some will have the gift of evangelism. Some of you just gather. You're gatherers. Brad Johnson is an evangelist. He, he gathers people around him. He's got the gospel coursing through his veins. He is an evangelist. It's a gift from God. <laughs> Glenn Fitter sitting here has leadership. It's obvious on his life. And, and we could go around the room and I could talk about different ones of you. And, and, I, and I don't want to just stop and, and, and only think that this is a patriarchal masculine thing. Heather Soto, initials HS, also known as Holy Spirit in our team, she holds everything together. She has an organizational gift. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so you want to pay attention to your shape. What are your spiritual gifts? What is in your heart? What are your natural abilities? Because all of that is going to make an incredibly huge difference. I don't know why this is doing this to me. It, there it goes. Okay, now I've got to pull it all back up again and scroll it back up and find my place. Forgive me, saints. P, your personality. What are we saying? Shape. Spiritual gifts. What's in your heart? What are your natural abilities? What's your personality? Everybody in the room in the same. Some of you put a microphone in your hand and you're just ready to take on hell with a water pistol. No backing up. Go, come on, follow me, lead the charge. Other folks are not as extroverted. Some of you are introverted. And there's nothing, one of those is not better than the other one. I have two children, and they are literally extremes of those. Drew is at a party, getting ready to leave for a party, and planning the next party. Actually made good grades in school, but if you would ask anybody, they said, oh, he's here purely for social reasons. Didn't miss school, loves school, because he just loves people. <laughs> Worked for two years. Continually calling. Finally ended up in an office of, of, of a billionaire corporate CEO, businessman in Dallas, Texas, 50-gallon hat, Wrangler jeans, big old cowboy boots, and he's sitting behind the desk, and he just, you know, toothpick in his mouth, and he said, well, Drew, tell me about yourself, son. And Drew said, well, sir, I was born in North Carolina, raised in Arkansas, and I got to Texas as quick as I could. 
That guy slapped his knee. He said, boy, I like you. I'm going to give you some of my business. You talk to anybody. Now, you put a microphone in front of Abby in front of a crowd of 30,000 people. I saw her do it when she opened for John Mayer last year, and she holds the room in the palm of her hand. But you meet her one-on-one, and she's a little socially anxious, a little extroverted, can spend hours in her room by herself, doesn't need anybody. Drew's 10 minutes in his room, and he's climbing the walls. he got to come out of there. What am I saying? We're different. We're not the same. Are you, are you following me this morning? Are you getting anything out of this? All right, as we look to the Word, and the next one, the very last one, is experiences. Our life experiences. Everyone in this room has had different things that have affected your view, your life view, your worldview, your perspective, your ethics, your politics, your theology, and everybody has one. Even the atheist who doesn't believe in God, that is still a theology. What you believe about God affects how you live in this world. And so your experiences and the composite of all of those have a direct effect on how you live life. We are purposed by God, each with a unique set or mix of characteristics. Number three, suited for a life of excellence that comes when we faithfully manage what we've been given all to the glory of God. Number three, life is ministry. Life is ministry. God doesn't just call us to raise money and go to a foreign country. Literally, the charge at the end of every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the opening of the book of Acts in the Great Commission is all in the present progressive tense. He didn't say, all right, raise funds and go to Africa. And yes, I believe in foreign missions. I want you to know that. But literally, if we think in those terms, we do away with it in terms of our responsibility to have a mission lifestyle. It literally says in the Greek, as you are going into the world, as you are going to your work tomorrow, as you're going to school, as you're going into the community, as you're going into the world, make disciples of all nations. Baptizing in them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything that I command. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Life is ministry. And the greatest tool you have in your hand that is unique to you and not like anybody else's is your testimony. You went through a test and you passed it. You may have taken it a couple of times, but you lived long enough for God to take your test and turn it into a testimony. Come on, somebody in this room. You've been in a mess and God delivered you out of it and he made your mess a message that can encourage somebody else. David's psalm says in Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry, and he lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see it. Wait a minute. Do you see a song? You hear it. No, but he says this thing is so alive that people will see The change, the mess has become a message. The test has become a testimony. And your life is a ministry. Put your hands together. Many will see what he has done and be amazed, and they will put their trust in the Lord. The greatest thing you can do is do what the delivered demoniac said. Look what the Lord has done. I once was, but now I'm. Say that with me. I once was, you fill in the blank, but now I'm. I once was in bondage, but now I'm delivered. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. What is your blank? Because it's unique to your life, and your life is ministry. Understand your purpose. We are purposed by God, each with a unique mix of characteristics. Know your shape. Suited for a life of excellence that comes when we faithfully manage what we have been given. Point number four, steward the three T's in your life. How can we excel in maximizing our resources for the advancement of God's kingdom? Number one, know your purpose. Number two, understand your shape. I'm not going to break through that down, break that down again. Number three, life is ministry. Number four, steward the three T's. Time, and you know what? This is where we have an even playing field. Nobody in the room has a 28-hour day. 
Nobody in the room has a 16-hour day. Everybody has the same 24 hours. Every hour has 60 minutes. Every minute has 60 seconds. Now, let me qualify that because there are seasons in your life where you have intense levels of commitment that take more of your time. Sitting right here, both of our pastors, three littles under four, five. Happy birthday, Georgia Lee. Five years old. Everybody say, strengthen Pastor Haley. And I go over here and I look at this handsome Latino Hispanic pastor who's amazing. It's an amaz- amazing man of God. And he's married to this be- boy. Did you ever marry up? I want to tell you the truth. And they have four. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. On Cinco de Mayo. I got to quit. That's just forgive me, okay? Four gorgeous models in the house. You're talking about an estrogen overload in the Soto house. You do have a boy dog, right? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Okay. At least you got a little bit of fellowship there somewhere. So there are seasons in your life when you have greater levels of commitment and don't have the same. My kids are grown. My wife is in her eternal reward. God bless. Rest in peace, baby. And so I have more time. And the the challenge is, is that I don't put the level of expectation that I can fulfill myself on these two people. One thing that I've done from the beginning is that I have not let, I said years ago, I refuse to sacrifice my family on the altar of ministerial success. We could have had a bigger church, we could have been in the building sooner, but I would have had kids that hated me and hated God. And so I always prioritized. Folk would call and say, Pastor, can we, you see, I said, no, I'm sorry, I have an appointment. They didn't know that it was a date night with my wife or it was time with my children that got the calendar first. How many of you know that's just right? Come on. Don't, don't look at me like that. You know, some of your families, you, you, wanna, you want green grass in your pasture? Quit looking over there where you think the grass is greener. Water and fertilize your grass. Somebody say amen. Talent, what are you doing with what you've been given? What your skills, your talents, these are the things that God has given you. And your sacrifice is what you give back to God. Thirdly, let me wrap this up. Treasure, nothing reveals your heart like how you handle your money. Your time, your talent, your treasure. Dr. Billy Graham says, you, you want to show me you have a heart for God? Show me two things. Show me your calendar. What do you do with your time? Show me your checkbook. What do you do with your money? The, but Jesus didn't say that, that where your heart is, there is your treasure. He said, no, where, you put, where you're putting your money, that reveals your heart. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So just, just be your own judge and jury. I'm not judging anybody. I'm not loaded for bear on anybody. But you know, when everything else gets priority and the house of God is last, and then you wonder why, okay, God, why don't you bless this or that? And you, you know, you're using all of your resources for something else. And there's nothing wrong with hunting clubs and country clubs and golf. And, and you know, I, 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 I rewarded myself after I lost 100 pounds and bought a real road bike. And it's, 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 it's a few bucks. I'm not even going to tell you. Some of you get mad if you knew what I spent on that Italian Cervelo bike. But I remember the very first day I did the farm loop 14 miles after I had, I had been doing it and timing myself. And I got off the, the hybrid mountain bike, and I got onto that road bike. I always was just doing it with everything in my might, as hard as I could. And that first day on that new bike, I shaved 14 minutes off of my time around that. Yeah, a little bit every day. First time I rode that farm loop took me over 90 minutes. Every day, I'm trying to beat the time a little bit more, just being consistent, day in day out. And I was right at an hour the last time I rode that hybrid mountain bike 
and I rode that surveillance the next day, and I went from 60 minutes to 46 minutes around that loop. That's how light that thing is. Whew. Glory to God. I like it. I don't, I don't have hunting club dues. I don't have 49 shotguns. I don't have three sets of $10,000 golf clubs. I do have a bicycle that costs a few bucks. So just forgive me, because you all have your flavors that you spend your money on. But God gets his tithe first in the house of the Lord. Come on, somebody. Put your hands together. Are you getting anything out of this? I sure hope so, because I'm finished. Number five, do everything for the Lord. Everything you do. Everything you do. I don't care if you don't like the boss or the supervisor. Quit working for the supervisor. Start working for Jesus. Realize that Jesus ultimately is in charge of your paycheck. We are purposed by God, each with a unique mix of characteristics suited for a life of excellence that comes when we faithfully manage what we've been given all to the glory of God. Do everything for the Lord. Colossians 3, 23, 24, and I'm finished. Work willingly. Come on, musicians, come back. Work willingly. Everybody say willingly. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. People will tick you off. And Christians are not exempt Church folk. <laughs> Sheep can bite. Goats definitely butt. <clears throat> they butt you. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Last verse. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. Whatever you do, do it for Jesus. This morning, we're purposed by God, each with a unique set of a mix of characteristics suited for a life of excellence that comes when we faithfully manage what we've been given all to the glory of God. Next Sunday, I'm going to be giving our State of the Church address, all of our members, if you've been through, if you've been through foundations and you've come to the front and we've received you in as a member at Victory Church, it's, they've gone out in the mail, you'll get a statement of everything that shows you what happened last year, where we are. I'll be talking about our spiritual accomplishments. I'll be talking about goals that we're setting for the new year in 2024 on our spiritual, our state of the church address next Sunday. And then after that, I'm going to be starting a new series on the word called Lamp and Light. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 105. I'm excited about that. Now, even though next Sunday sounds like a business meeting, it's not. Please come and hear, hear what what we've been able to celebrate and accomplish here where we're headed because I believe that God is bringing us out of survival into revival. Say that with me. Out of survival into revival. Put your hands together and give the Lord praise. What happened? There it is. Musicians are back and we're going to sing just a a chorus of this song, Send Me. And before we do, um, receive the Lord's table. Pastor Haley is going to come and tell you how we're doing this a little bit differently today. Like we did last year in January, we we received the Lord's table in stations. And so we're going to do that, and I'll give her the mic and let her talk to you about that. But in this moment, after this message, I just want to challenge you. you. Do you understand your purpose? Do you know why you're here? God made you uniquely with purpose for a purpose. Do you you understand your shape, that there's a unique mix of characteristics in your life that nobody else in the room has? Do you know that your life is a ministry, that you have a testimony that nobody else can tell? You got a song, ain't nobody else can sing. You got to sing it. Number four, steward the three T's. Quit worrying about what you don't have and be grateful for what you do have and manage it well. Your time whatever season you're in, your talent, whatever gifts you've been given, your treasure, whatever God has trusted in your hands to be a financial steward over. Be faithful with it. Manage it. Invest. Save. Give to the work of the Lord. Pay your bills on time. Do all that. Okay? Number five, 
As we close this morning, let's remember the attitude of this one because it holds everything else together. Do everything for the Lord. Everything for God. Not the, not the person at work, not the boss, not the company, not the CEO. Work for the Lord willingly with a good attitude. Bow your hearts and your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, as we close this message today, thank you that you bring us, Lord, just square face to face with where we are. Challenge us, Father, when we have been tired and burnt out and lethargic and Lord maybe we've already tried to set some goals and we've given up on them a couple of leaves got turned over and everything else is just still there whatever we thought we were going to be able to accomplish something's given us a setback give us a fresh wind fresh fire in our hearts this morning as we look to you and we seek your face and God that we would that we would know our purpose, that you have made us to be a masterpiece, a workmanship, that you're doing a work in us that no weapon of the enemy can ever destroy. Thank you that you've given us all a unique shape. And Lord, you've given us a testimony, a message that came from a mess that we were in. Help us to open our mouths and say, look what the Lord has done. Give me new management skills in my time and my talent and my treasure and Lord help me with a fresh start in the attitude that everything is for you it's all for your glory we, we commit these things in this moment heads bowed eyes closed nobody looking around if this is you this morning and you would say pastor this word has resonated deep in my heart and I want to lift my hand just to say please pray for me because I need a fresh start in this year Anybody in this room? Yes. Half dozen hands. More than that went up around the room. Yes. Thank you, Father, for these today. We look to you and we ask you, Lord, that in seasons when we feel far from you, that let us turn and take one step. And, Lord, that you would take up and make up the space and run to us. Fill us today with your Holy Spirit. Forgive us of our sins, we pray, and we ask you in Jesus' name that you would be Lord of our lives that we would maximize our resources to excel in advancing the kingdom of God. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and all of God's people said, amen. Amen.